Howard Burkholz out of Utah is going to ans and answer your questions. All right, Howard, it's all yours. Okay. All right, well, it's nice to be here with you. My name is Howard Burkholz, and uh, I've um, just a little background, and then I'll get right into it. Um, I have been a photographer uh, just as a hobby, you know, a lot of my life. And uh, my um, father actually work, uh, was a photographer, a still photographer um, in Korea, in the Korean War. And when he came out of that experience, he went to um, Brigham Young University in Utah and um, got his journalism degree and in and specialized in photography and just loved it and I've always been around it and it's been fun for me to experience that um, my profession uh, is insurance I've been doing it for 18 years and about four ish five ish years ago the two intersected and it happened you get this on at my son's wedding so my oldest son, he's in his fourth year of medical school. He's getting married to a fourth, year, a fourth year medical student. And we go to the wedding and the photographer says to me, hey, do you do insurance? And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's what I do, I'm insurance. And he goes, well, for photography. And I said, I think. And I didn't know a lot about it. I was like most of the people that you run across when you call around to get insurance and they do a lot of different things. Like, yes, 10 minutes earlier, they were talking to a florist, and an hour or two before, they were talking to a dry cleaner, right? They're just all over the place, and they're generalists, and they, they try to, to do the best they can with all the, the demands that are placed upon them. Um, so I dug into it, and I found out there's a vacuum that sucked me in. There is so much need for someone who really understands the photography risk exposures and all of the uh, ins and outs and the avenues that you guys are, uh, your risk exposures that you're faced with. And I've learned them and I specialize in it. And um, just for maybe credibility purposes, um, I've been vetted by the national ASMP. I'm on their website as a member benefits provider um, for photography business insurance. And we take care of the whole country for ASMP and PPA. Um, we're making progresses in the chapters, a lot of progress in the chapters. On the national level, level they have a pretty tight relationship with a company called Lockton. In fact, when you sign up for PPA, you get a, a policy with them for $15,000 of equipment. And, and I'll be talking more about that in, the, in this presentation. So anyway, that's a little bit about me and about my background. So, okay, so um, by, by the way, um, our website is nationalphotographersinsurance.com. There's a little button in the top. It says request a quote, just a questionnaire. It says, who are you? Are you an LLC, a sole proprietor, an S Corp? How much gear do you have? What kind of shooting do you do? Do you use drones? Little questionnaire there, about 20, 22 questions. And then I get that on my desk. We quote it. We send it out to you, a proposal that's completely customized for you and what you do and how you roll and how much gear you have and, and so on. And then, um, you know, within a day or two, we'll probably get an email from you saying, I got some questions or we can call you if you just shoot us an email saying, call me, I want to talk to you. Um, we'll, we'll follow up with that and, and make some tweaks and some adjustments and get you guys all worked up and figured out. And, and uh, we, we're happy to, happy to help, help with that. Okay, so th this is the little disclaimer. This information is advisory in nature and is in general and broad. Every insurance policy has wording in it that was written by attorneys, and they're all different. So I can't comment on your policy and your coverage. I don't know what it says. So, so this is broad stuff. This is high level, broad concept stuff. If you want me to read your policy and tell you what it is, just send it to me and I'll tell you what you got and, and what's going on. Okay, so when we, we, we know in life, crap happens, right? And when, when we're, especially when you're running a photography business, and these are called risk exposures, a good insurance program will respond favorably when you have something bad happen. And that's what we're all about. Uh, particularly if you find yourself in the first floor of a two-story outhouse. This is where I'm soliciting laughter. By the way, this is the son, the one that just got married that I was telling you about. This is him. <laughs> this is my daughter. 
And um, that, that little um, outhouse, by the way, is in Montana. It's in a place called Ennis, Montana. <laughs> so if you ever wanted to go find that thing. Anyway, but together, what I work do with, with the photography folks is, is work to set up and put together a program that will manage your risk exposure. And when you pay premium to an insurance company, you're, they're agreeing to take upon themselves the risk exposures, the financial risk exposures that you have in the conduct of your business. So you're shifting the financial, the, the, the pocketbook, that's the hit to your pocketbook is getting shifted from you to the insurance company. Okay, so the um, core and the foundation of a good risk management program is called a BOP. It's a business owner's policy. And uh, think of if you own a home, you have a homeowner's policy, right? And it's a package. It has a whole bunch of lines to it, a whole bunch of this, that, and the others. And so same thing with business owner's policy. By the way, all state insurance company um, invented or were the first creators of the BOP back in the um, late 60s, in about 1969, 1970, right in there, was the, the first BOP was created. It was like a homeowner's policy for business owners. And, uh, and they, they've been in, it, in the business and doing it ever since. Okay, so number one, risk number one, bodily injury, right? Something can happen to your client when you're doing a, a, a shoot. So we need to protect you. So the, the photographer says, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's go over here and do this great shoot, right? Somebody gets hurt. They're coming after you and saying you are liable for your negligence that put my client, your client in danger or in harm, harm's way. So that's what we do is we take the transfer the risk. If one of your clients gets injured on a shoot, shoot or property damage occurs, that you cause property damage to another party, then uh, it's taken care of through a coverage called general liability. So two things, general liability, property damage to others, bodily injury to others. Those are the two areas that general liability covers. Usually limits are 1 million per occurrence, 2 million aggregate, but sometimes 2 million, 4 million, and they're available too through um, all of the programs that we offer. The, the 2 million, 4 million is available as well. Okay, so in this photograph, you'll notice a photographer most likely was standing probably where he shouldn't on a bicycle race. And the bicycle racer struck the photographer, the bike goes down and gets bent to crap. And those things are expensive, right? Bikes are super, those race level bikes can be $20,000. Um, the, the uh, person, the biker, the the participant in the event could have medical and injuries involved. Uh, it could even get bigger than that if they're the type of injuries that prevent him from furthering his income, which if he's a professional biker, he makes money riding. If it prohibits him from continuing on in his profession, you're at a million dollars, $2 million already. They're just going to say, well, he was making $100,000 a year riding bikes and his career would have gone another 12 years. That's about 1.2 million. Then we've got um, pain and suffering and you're there. It's, it's maxed out, it's all over. So, and without this kind of insurance, guess where that money comes from? From your equity in your house, from your 401k plan, from your, you know, it's coming from you, right? That's where that money comes from. So that's why you have insurance. You pay a little premium, the risk transfer that we talked about earlier. Okay, by the way, we do additional insured certificates um, through Allstate, they're free of charge. There is a $26 per year, once a year fee for an endorsement on the policy called an additional insured endorsement. It's just a page that sits on your policy and it modifies the content of the master policy. But to add that endorsement to the policy is $26. The certificates are unlimited. They're free. My office processes them all the time. I have people sign up with our program just for that because they're getting charged 30 bucks a cert every time they need a certificate. Their insurance company um, it hits them with a the fee. Okay, so let's talk about a little, little more complicated stuff here, using subcontractors. So now before I go into the details of these bullet points and we look at this picture and say what's going on, I want to give you a broad level stuff, okay? So a general contractor is going to build a building, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't know anything about plumbing. He doesn't know much about electrical. He doesn't do foundations. He's the general. So he hires a plumber, an electrician, and a general. And he tells those people, when you come here, if something happens and you get hurt and anybody gets hurt, 
I don't want your work hitting my policy. I have an insurance policy. I don't want my policy paying for your mistakes. So subcontractors should have their own insurance. In fact, they require it. They say for you to work on my job site, you need to add me to your policy and make me make excuse me and make your policy primary and non-contributory. My insurance is not going to contribute to a something you mess up on. Yours is primary and mine is not contributory or non-contributory to a disaster that you cause Mr. Plumber when you're soldering and you burn the building down and we have a big problem, right? We have a big claim on our hands. Okay, so so primary, non-contributory, additional insured, generals get subs. Well, when you do a shoot and you use a sud, think of you as the building owner. You're the building owner, you're the builder, you're, you're the general and your subs should have their own insurance and you should have them add you to your their policy as an additional insured so that their policy is primary and yours doesn't contribute. Okay, now that was heavy, right? Nobody got that. Did you kind of follow it a little bit? Okay, so it's it, that's the basics of, of what we're doing here. So when you hire a subcontractor, your liability insurance on your own policy, it doesn't protect them. Just like your liability on your own policy doesn't protect you. If you're out there shooting and you hurt yourself, your liability policy isn't gonna help you because liability means harm to others, right? Liability, harm to others. You can't be liable to yourself, you can only be liable to others. So when you hire somebody, a sub or an employee, your liability insurance policy on your BOP doesn't cover injury that can cause to them, okay? So that, that's one, the first principle here. Okay, so let's see, look, let's look at this picture for a second. So the photographer, he's out there, he's got some subs, he's got two subs and he's got a model. So he sends the model out there that he hired and he says, stand right here, we're gonna get you some pictures by this bear and the two subcontractors are there and then you're there and something goes wrong and everybody dashes. So I suspect that, I don't know who the, who the main photographer is here, I can't really tell, but um, probably the guy going down hard right there with the tripod, but I, I don't know. <laughs> but the model's the guy on the right, you can tell, he's the fast one, so okay. <laughs> So, so, but what happens is here is if that bear gets to any one of those people, there is no coverage on your BOP for any bodily injury or harm for liability, none whatsoever, okay? Because they all work for you. It's your deal and they, you hired them. They are you, so you can't be liable to someone else. Now, let's say that you come up with this great idea and this is your client. This is your client and this is you and these are your two subs that are helping you do the shoot. And you say to the client, I got this great idea. We're gonna go stand by a bear and we're gonna shoot a picture. It'll be so awesome. The client gets hurt. Your liability coverage covers you and protects you because you're, you can be liable to your client, but you can't be liable to yourself. So does that kind of make sense? Okay, so there's another coverage called workers' compensation. Workers' compensa compensation protects your clients, or excuse me, your, your employees and your subs. So that's a whole nother policy. So sometimes people call and say, I need workers' comp for me to cover my employees and my subcontractors against injury uh, it should, should something happen to them. Okay, so make sure your subcontractors add you to their policy as an additional insured. Oh yeah, the last point, people always ask me this, are my subcontractors, are they covered under my policy? Not for their own injury, but if your sub hurts one of your clients, absolutely. Because remember, when you hire someone, they're you. So if you hurt someone, your policy covers you. If your sub hurts someone, your policy covers you. Okay. So that, that makes a lot of, I think that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So what could go wrong here? Any, any ideas? What's going to go wrong here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Think about that one for a second. Okay. Okay. All right. So remember, liability protects you from having to pay others that you may become liable for. So again, if this person climbing works for um, North Face and he's the client and he's got the things that he's putting in the walls, you know, they sell those things. My son's a climber, he did protection cams or something, I don't know, but he sticks them in the wall and, and, and North Face hires you and says, okay, we've got a guy that works for us and he's gonna be a climber and we want you to go photograph him. 
Does your liability protect you? Yes, it does. It protects injury to that ladder slipping and hitting the client. Yes, 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 they're your client. But if you are putting together a really cool brochure for yourself and you've hired the model and you've set up the ladder and somebody gets hurt, there's no liability on your policy coverage because that guy is you. He works for you. He's He's your guy, so workers' comp. So if you ever get in something like this, get a high workers' comp insurance policy, yeah. Is that defined by the cash flow that you're paying them or they're paying you? Very good point. It's exactly it, yeah. It's, it has to do exactly with the relationship that you have between the client. Are, are, are you paying, well, it could have, that does define the relationship, doesn't it? Who's paying who? So I believe yes. I believe the answer to that is yes. There's no great. Yeah, exactly. It's who's paying who. That's a good, very good point to measure that. Yeah. Okay. So injury to a client who initiated this shot creative. If the client comes to you and says, I want you to do this and I'm going to go climb up here without ropes. And then you take my picture and you get hurt. Better have a contract written up about whose idea this was, have some waiver sign. That's, that's more legal and, and client stuff. But if you initiate the creative, the shot, now, it doesn't matter who's paying, he, he may be paying you either way, but if you put this idea of yours is put your client in danger, your policy would, would cover you. Um, excuse me, if you put them in danger, your policy would protect you, but if it's their idea, you wouldn't need to, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so injury to, uh, injury to a hired model. Agreed contract terms of the shoot when signed and, and get waivers. So when you have a model that you're, um, you know, hired and you're taking them up there, make sure that you, they understand that what the risk is that they have. But your policy does cover people um, if you're hurting your client, but it doesn't cover them if you're co um, covering your, um, uh, your uh, employees or your subcontractors, people that you hire. A model is a, uh, a, model's a uh, subcontractor in this case. Okay, all right, we talked about that. Okay, another risk that you face is called professional liability or errors and omissions. Okay, some of the examples here are a photographer arrives at a, the wrong venue with no time to correct the error, um, doesn't show up, wrote down the wrong date on a calendar for an event, um, loses, or, uh, loses or damaged uh, memory cards, after you've completed a job, you can't produce the product that you were hired to produce. Um, images released to the incorrect party. Um, there's a, a situation that I've, I've had happen where um, a photographer used images of children and a family. They used the children's faces for another project a year or so later, and the family saw the images in an advertising spread and didn't give releases for that. So they wanted damages against you. So that's all under professional liability or errors and omissions insurance. Um, reshooting expenses, um, the photography, the, the, here's, a, here's a classic. Um, you shoot a wedding, the images go cor corrupt. You have no, no product to, that you uh, were hired to produce. And these now are legal precedent is set and the courts usually rule almost every single time that the photographer pays for the expenses of a reshoot. So you have to rent the cake, buy a cake and flowers, rent the dress, you know, rent the tuxes, clean the dress, fly grandma in from out of town, and restage a shoot a week later so that they have their once in a lifetime images that they hired you to produce that you didn't. So, and that all falls on your expense, so we can cover that. Um, we have, most of the photographers I work with are, um, about 25 to 50,000 is adequate. That's the most risk exposure they feel like they have when they do a shoot like that. Um, some, some photographers do have much higher. Some clients will require a million dollars of liability, of errors and omissions coverage as one of the requirements for a shoot that, that, um, that you're going to do. Um, I have a, I, I think, I, I hope this is okay to use a name, but I have a client, his name is uh, Jerry Guionis, Guionis, right? And so big, big wedding guy, right? Shoots big weddings. He charges over 100 grand for a wedding shoot, right? <laughs> and I, so he has very high E&O coverages with me because if something went wrong on a wedding that expensive, um, things are going to go bad and he needs more, more coverage and more liability. So think about that when you're, you're deciding what limits that you need. So, 
Okay, so, okay, drone liability. Um, there are some um, photography risk exposures and activities and operations that are higher and more expensive than others, or, or higher risk than others. Um, drone photography right now is perceived by the insurance industry as a risk exposure that's greater than a land photographer, a land-based photographer. So they charge more. So some carriers won't even cover you the land portion of your operation if you do a drone. So all the, I've heard this happen. People go, I'm starting to use a drone. And I call the carrier that they're insured with and say, this client is looking into insurance with me. Does your insurance um, cover drones? He's asking me to, to help him sort through this. And they'll say, no, it doesn't. In fact, now that we know he's using a drone, he's canceled. I love that because then I just gain a client just like that. No, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't, I don't think that way. But anyway, but, but you get the idea. They don't, even though their policy has exclusions in it that says we won't cover the drone operation, they're still afraid of getting dragged into one. And they, they don't even want to touch you if, you, if you're for your land portion of your photography. So, but now some carriers will cover land operations and exclude your drone operations. And that just happened with Allstate in March of, or in April of this year. So before they were the, they were the top list, just like um, all the other carriers I represent, Hartford and CNA and Travelers and Allstate and USLI and all these companies, they were all up in the top category. Well, Allstate now, will cover the land portion of your operation, even though you're a drone user, but they don't cover the drone operations of your, of your operation. So for that situation, I recommend that you use a company called Verifly. Has anyone heard of Verifly? Okay, so there's an app, you download their app on the phone, Verifly, and you're standing there, there's your drone, and you say, I want, I'm gonna fly for an hour, and I'm gonna fly within line of sight, and I'm, a, I'm not gonna go higher than 400 feet, which is the FAA rule, and I'm not, you know, and you comply and you hit a button, and it tests, tests your airspace with the GPS in the phone, and it says, you're good, fly, 10 bucks. You buy a million dollar liability for a $10, $10, a flight right now. So it's an on-demand pay by the flight. It's kind of a system, yeah. If you use a drone, I mean, will it cover if you use a drone inside, like if you do an event? Mm-hmm. There's, for me to speak about Verifly would be um, probably not appropriate. I'm not sure if there's any exclusions on Verifly's app. They would tell you though on the app when you're about to, but, and, and you're about to do it. The next type of, of and by the way, the, the folks that do that are the ones that are doing, um, you know, a dozen flights a year, two dozen flights a year. You add it up, two dozen flights a year, that's $240, right? So that's about your cost of doing uh, two dozen flights a year with Verifly and land-based photography operation. Now, some companies now do both land and drone operations. Prices start at about $611 a year. So I've been doing a lot of those lately. There's a company that does the land and the drone all in one bot policy. So it's a, a, it's a really good program. And the pricing is pretty reasonable. So if you're a drone user, uh, let me know. But I have a bunch of people who said that are coming over and saying that they're paying over a thousand a year for that kind of coverage. And I can speak about this one because I've read it and I know it. And this one, there's no exclusion in your policy that says that, um, that indoor drone photography would be excluded in coverage. So yeah, you'd have coverage for that. So. So anyway, any, any drone photographers out there? Not yet, okay. All right, so now another risk exposure is your equipment, right? Everybody out wants to make sure their equipment's covered. So what happens is when a person has a homeowner's insurance policy and they have their gear covered on their homeowner's insurance, they think they're just great and they're just fine. The problem is, is in a homeowner's policy, there's, a, there's an exclusion or a limitation in the fine print that says, we will cover your equipment for this, except when used in a business. If it's used in a business, now the limit of property coverage is $200 off premises, $2,000 on premises. So as soon as they, whether you're using your equipment for full-time or part-time economic gain, and you file a claim and they look at your website and see that you're a professional and you're charging fees, they're gonna say, 
your gear's covered for a limit of $200 off premises. So there, there is a mistake. People sometimes believe that their gear's covered on their homeowners, and it's not if you're earning money, if you're charging. If you're a total hobbyist and you never made a penny in photography, you're covered. Just It's covered on your homeowner's insurance. But if you're, if you're in, making an income from your business, uh, your property is, is excluded on your homeowner's insurance. And so we have a, a two ways of, of uh, tackling the equipment equipment coverage. Um, one is um, is a, a program called Inland Marine Coverage. So I'll talk about that real quick. So back in the late 1600s, early 1700s, um, merchants in England were wanting to send their cargo across the land and across the sea to the colonies. So Lloyd's of London created for the first time an insurance program that would insure the cargo of these merchants on land and on sea. And that's where the word inland marie came from. And nowadays we should add air because back then they didn't have airplanes, but now they couldn't even imagine. But now we have airplanes, so air as well, but they still call it inland marine. But it's basically saying, we're going to cover your gear wherever it goes in the world. And, uh, you know, air, land, water, underwater. I know that there's a question coming about underwater. Your gear's covered underwater as well. If the housing fails and water leaks and it's covered, there's no exclusions in those inland marine policies that have that. Now, because the coverage is so broad, they um, say, we're going to settle this claim on an actual cash value for your equipment. So they're going to say, this lens, I just had a claim a couple weeks ago, um, $3,000 Olympus lens, changing it, drops it, it's annihilated, send it to Olympus, they can't fix it, it's done, it's over. So the insurance company looks at it and they say, it's worth $51 less today than it was when you bought it. The guy was thrilled, $51 depreciation, he was giddy, he was so happy that he could get a settlement. Right now, if it's a six-year-old digital body, my first I bought my first Canon camera, and I still have it. It's a digital camera. I, think, I can't even remember what it's called, but in 2003, if that thing goes down, they might give me 50 bucks for it, right? It's not worth much. It's, I think it takes like a two megapixel picture. It's so powerful at the time, right? It was just the best thing on the market, right? So they're not going to give me much for it. So, so that's, that's Inland Marine. There's an element of depreciation on those things. Yeah. But when you bought the equipment, and let's say you bought a five thousand dollar camera, yeah, two years later, it's or a period later, it's only worth a hundred dollars. Yeah. Then what do you do with with that? Because you've insured a five thousand dollar camera. Yeah. And then in five years, it's worth a hundred dollars because the technology's dead. Yeah. How does that work on your policy? Do you tell? Does your policy get adjusted? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, we're, are we insuring yeah. over-insuring equipment mm -hmm. that is no longer worth the money? Exactly. Right, right, right. So, so this is the thing is that what, what we do is we have two insurance policies in play when we take care of our, the, our clients. One is the BOP and one is a completely separate policy called an Inland Marine. And on the Inland Marine policy, we ask you to tell us what would you like your limit of coverage to be? And, um, and, if that, and that limit should be calculated based on the value, not the cost new, but the value of your equipment. So you can adjust that up and down based on the value of your equipment. But it's something we have to do manual. It's not an automatic adjustment. So we would need to adjust it down. Now, let me give you a perspective on this. The Inland Marine policy for $20,000 of coverage is 100 bucks a year. That's what our cost is, for $20,000 a year, 100 bucks a year. So it's pretty inexpensive stuff. By the way, those of you who are PPA members, you have an Inland Marine coverage that's built into your membership. It's $15,000 of Inland Marine, and it's an actual cash value claim settlement. So your gear is going to be paid out based on what they perceive the value is at the time of the loss. So, so just if you have that, you, you have that already. Okay, so now on the business owner's policy, you're going to like this. Business owner's policy, the equipment is replacement cost new. So here's an example. I have a client who has a, five, a 500 millimeter Nikon lens. It was like 15 years old. He said he paid around $6,000 for it. It went kaboots, gone. He had to pay a claim. What do they cost new? Nikon, 500 mils, about 11 grand, right? 
So we paid $11,000 for a lens that he paid $6,000 for because some pieces of equipment go up in value, not down. So we pay replacement costs new. Now, digital bodies, digital cameras, D800, they don't make it anymore. What's the closest thing? D810. That's what they'll pay for. They'll go right to, they'll go to Adorama, they'll go to B&H, and they'll go to, you know, Prime, Amazon Prime, and they'll look and they'll see, what are they selling these things for new? And they'll buy replacement costs new to the nearest model that matches the one that you had lost. So, so what happens is people call me and say, Howard, this is what happened. I go, okay, we're going to the BOP. Better settlement. You're gonna, it's a better claim. We're going to uh, file this through the BOP. Okay, now someone calls and says exact same thing happens, but it didn't happen in, um, in Scottsdale. It happened when I was in Italy. Well, I have no choice. We have to file it through the Inland Marine because of the BOP coverage is only in the United States, Canada, and its territories. So there's exclusions on the BOP that make it so that we have to go to the Inland Marine. It's more of a backup though. I always, we always go to the BOP first. Inland Marine is, is backup coverage. So, okay. So, and, uh, and by the way, we, I have clients who have $180,000 of gear coverage, so we can do limits. You, you got a lot of stuff, we can handle it and we can replace it all new. Yeah. What's the turnaround time for a? Yeah. Okay. Once a, a claim is filed uh -huh. for a damage, so you drop. I dropped my camera today. How yeah. long does it take for me to get the replacement uh, or a check? Okay. So that can be, I would say about a week to two weeks. But let me tell you the process. This is what happens: is first of all, it, it actually it can be. You can have it. You can be back in business shooting again as soon as you can get to a camera store and buy a new one. And then, because it's about reimbursement, we're going to reimburse you. So you're back in business as quick as you want to be. But what people do is they hesit they, they're hesitant to go out and spend the money until they know for sure coverage is, it's covered, right? They want to know it's covered before they go out and buy all the stuff. So the only thing that holds that up is, is uh, eliminating the possibility of repair. So if it can be repaired, They'll, they'll pay for the repair. If it can't be repaired, they'll pay for the replacement. But they want to find that out from a shop that's reputable that can make that assessment. So as soon as they can make that assessment, and as soon as they say it's not a repairable, they fax the letter over to us or email a letter over to us and say, this is unrepairable. You're buying it right now, and we should have a check to you within a few days. We can get that paid to you quick. Okay, and it's the same thing if it's repairable. I can go ahead and get it repaired, and I'll just get reimbursed. Absolutely, yep. Yep, repair, but they're gonna always try to repair it first if it's repairable before they'll guarantee the, the replacement. Oh yeah, and then, by the way, I get a lot of these. Um, people wanna rent and they wanna be, they want they have they want to put a deposit of eight grand on their credit card, right? Or something for the rental. No, this will eliminate that. You just call us and say, I need a certificate, lost payee, Sammy's camera and we send it over, and now you have no deposits. It's all covered. Your rental, rented gear is covered. Oh, by the way, the policy also says your gear, any gear that is in your care, custody, and control is covered. So it, it rented can't gear, borrowed gear, if it's in your care, custody, and control, you're covered. Your gear is covered for that. So we can do search, search for that. Okay, so on the BOP, oh, and I've really talked about this, but I'm going to just mention it. So on the business owner's policy, there's some wording in the, in the policy. It's the fine print. This is the stuff where you don't want to learn about it at a claim time. I'm going to, I know it already, and I'm going to tell you up front what the fine print is. By the way, that's why we have the in the Marine. It's, it's backup. But the fine print on some of these BOP policies, and it's not just all states, it's all of them, says we will cover your equipment when it's on inland waterways, we, we won't cover your equipment on, on water unless it's an inland waterway and it's incidental to the land portion of your journey. So they're saying, we're not covering your gear if you're on a four-day river run down the Colorado. That's what they're saying. They're saying if you're crossing the Colorado and you're taking pictures and you drop your camera and they'll cover you. But if you're on a four-day river run and your whole bag goes in the drink, it's not covered under the box. Right? This is the fine print stuff. This is why you want me is because I'm going to tell you right up. We're going to figure this out together. So there's no surprises down the road. Okay. So the inland marine, no such exclusion. So you're driving, you're going down the river, you drop your whole bag in. It's all covered under the inland marine policy. So, so forgot me. So, and there's about four of them. One other one that they have is, um, 
the, oh, we talked about this. So wa inland uh, on water is, is BOP can go either way. Um, the inland marine outside of the country, it's the only way to cover your gear. And then we'll, we'll talk about these next ones. And then there's another one. Here, here's one that says this. The, the, all these policies say the same thing about gear. They say, we will cover your equipment in your car if you lock your doors, the compartments are locked, the doors are locked, and everything's locked. And, it, and then someone breaks in. The way they know that you lock your door is there has to be physical evidence of damage, right? They break the window, break in your door and steal your stuff. It's covered under the BOP. But if you didn't lock your door and they steal your stuff, it's not covered under the BOP. They have a little clause in the bot in there that says we don't cover it unless it was broken into. You have to have evidence of a break in, so we won't cover it. No such exclusion on the inland marine. So this is what's happened is I've never had a claim denied by doing it this way for equipment ever because the inland marine is backup, it's secondary. We always go to the BOP first, backup is secondary. Okay, all right, so law, okay, loss of business income and then we're about done actually. Um, so if you're about to do a shoot and your camera gear gets stolen out of your car and it, they break the window and they steal your gear and you're about to do a shoot and you can't do it, you have no gear, you lose income. Okay, it's covered on your BOP. Loss of business income, it's covered on your BOP. Now, some of the insurance policies say it has to be a loss that originated on the premises, the named address on your policy. It can't be out in the field. So, and I'll say it's one of those. It has to be on your premises. So if your camera gear gets stolen from your shop, your home, whatever it is, then you're covered. But if you're out on a shoot and you have your gear covered, they, they won't cover the loss of business income for the upcoming shoot that you're about to do. Well, that's stupid, right? We're always out doing work. That's where our stuff's most at risk. So they're right now creating, because I told them to, an endorsement on the policy that said that we can put, um, cover your equipment, excuse me, if your gear is stolen away from premises and then you lose business income, then we'll cover the business income and the rental equipment, the camera that you need to go rent quick so that you can go do the shoot that you're about to do. So I, it's, it's uh, one of those things that's um, forth, forthcoming. There is a carrier though that does it now, Hartford. The Hartford does it now. So I, if that's super important to you, I can get you um, into a program that will do that right now. Oh, one other thing. Remember I told you about um, foreign travel, foreign travel? CNA has a product where if you schedule their equipment on the Inland Marine, it's covered replacement costs new worldwide. Allstate is, but it's expensive. It costs like 400 bucks for the same $20,000 of gear that Allstate does for 100. So if you want things like that, we have them, but there, there's some, uh, gonna be some expensive. All. Okay, then the, let's see. Okay, so here's another one. There's another uh, risk that you face is if you go rent another studio, you rent Nick's studio and you're here to do a shoot. And while you're here, the um, seniors, you're doing a senior shoot, the football guys, Decide they're going to do something and damage the, the studio. They throw spitballs at things. I don't know what they're doing. But anyway, the, but everything gets damaged. So the photographer that rented the studio has Paul coverage to recover for the damage that was done to the rented premises that you uh, uh, rented. Maybe it's something with the light. Maybe it's something with the electrical. Maybe it's something that burned the whole place down. Who knows what could happen? But you have coverage to protect you against um, damage that, you can do to a premises that you rent. Uh, you go to a hotel room and you are doing a shoot there and something happens, you do some, do some damage there. Oh yeah, and here's another one, um, hard disk damage. So if, you're, if your hard disk drive gets damaged, you know there are companies out there that do data extraction. They can somehow get the data off of there and copy it onto a new thing. So the insurance policy pays for the, the data extraction portion of your loss that you can suffer. Now, it has to be due to a physical loss. So water damages it, electrical surge fries it. There has to be some evidence to the device that there was physical damage occurred. And that could be a surge, you know, that fries a circuit inside, they open up, they go, yeah, there's physical damage here. Then they'll, they'll pay for it. If it's just completely fine and it just stopped working because it's 12 years old and you probably should have replaced it anyway, there's got to be sign of physical damage for it to be, to be covered. Okay. So, okay. And then, um, yeah. Uh -huh. It got, um, what if the disc, somehow got knocked off of something. And Breakage is the... physical damage, yeah, okay, absolutely, yep, yep. 
What's that? What's that? Do you guys have a limit on, um, like, if it take if it's up fifteen hundred dollars to recover my memory up of a hard disk? Is there a limit on? There isn't. If I had a I had a client who had a, forgive me, a RAID array. Does that make sense? RAID array where it was multiple things mirroring each other and yada yada. One of the damage got physically damaged and it caused some corruption to the others and it was $7,500 to rebuild the whole thing some data extraction company paid so yeah it can do it can do all that kind of stuff yeah so okay and then okay there are some other coverages that are not as important to photographers but they are on the policy um cash uh securities um, uh, accounts receivables. People ask me a lot about that. What does that mean? So if you have a QuickBooks and you have an invoicing system and you're invoicing your clients and you have maybe 30 invoices out there that are still uncollected, those are your accounts receivable. So if those get damaged or lost, the insurance policy responds to paying to rebuild or recreate the amount of money that is owed you, your evidence of, or your paper trail of, of what people owe you. It does not pay the bill the, of the cl that the client owes you, but it helps you recreate the um, data so that they can, you can get your um, money back. Okay, so another one that's kind of interesting is if your computer suffers, suffers a, um, oh yeah, by the way, up till now, the little flyer I gave you, if you're a home-based photographer, the left column, if you're a studio photographer, right column, home-based photographer, right around $375 a year, we can do all that we've talked about so far. Pretty close. It, everybody's a little bit different, but and with those limits. So we'll, if we have to customize things, raise things, then it would bring the price up a little bit. Retail studio on the right, unless you have higher equipment limits than is on the, on the screen. Now, this next, these next two things I've not included in here, they're optional. Cyber one is, um, is it, it's like you've heard of this ransomware stuff where people get your computer and you pay them a fee and they'll release your computer back to you or something. So that's what this kind of stuff is, is, is viruses and ransomwares and, and that kind of thing. That's what cyber one is all about. The next one, data compromise, wouldn't recommend it. It's um, designed more for um, uh, dental offices, um, doctors where they're keeping track of people's medical records, social security numbers, birth dates. So every, most of the photographers I talk to, they don't keep clients' birth dates and social security numbers and you know drivers, any, any personal data. So it's not important, I wouldn't think, uh, in, in your situation. Okay, and then we talked a little bit about workers' comp. Um, workers' compensation is the, the additional policy that you need to cover your um, employees and your subcontractors. We have those, people sometimes ask me costs. Um, if you pay $10,000 a year in subcontractors um, or employees in payroll, and it, you, most photographers just use them when they need them, not like a second shooter and things like that. Um, they're roughly $350 a year to 500 in California. I don't, I'm not sure in Arizona, probably 350 to 500 a year for a $10,000 workers' compensation uh, insurance policy. So that's it. So um, Q&A, I'm ready for you. All right, the part you don't, you've all been waiting for, questions. Okay, so, um, this is just a hypothetical. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it would be under a BOP policy or not, but... If you were doing a photo shoot in a pool mm -hmm. and you were renting the pool facility from a city, say like Scottsdale, okay. they're requiring that you cover, you have $1 million worth of liability insurance naming the city of Scottsdale as additional insured is required. Insurance is due seven days prior to the session and non-compliance results are forfeiting the facility. So is that part of your BOP coverage for the use of property or is that a separate policy rider that you get and what would that cost a client yeah. no that's all part of the bop 
Yep, that's the million dollar per occurrence, two million aggregate. That's part of the BOP. That we, one of the first items that we went to on the slides, and then we add their name as an additional insured on the policy. And again, th and by the way, th this is so confusing. I don't know why they call it. You're not. We're not additionally insuring the city of Scottsdale. It's this. Why do they call it additional insured then? Because you're not additionally insuring. What you're doing is saying that. Scottsdale has their own insurance. They're responsible for what they do. You're now responsible for what you do. And the additional insured rider endorsement just simply says that we're defining who's responsible for what. My insurance is responsible for me and what I do. And it's primary and non-contributory and Scottsdale's sitting in the background. So that's all that document does. But we're not additionally insuring the party or the entity. Yeah coverage uh-huh yeah but that's a location that's not your studio and that's not your home that's okay that's so no problem that's still what policy would you want to be under if you were doing those kinds of shoots on locations yeah it's that okay. the bop does it absolutely does what, it what i'm asking oh. i guess is which one the home business or the studio business. Oh, I get it. I see your question. No. So the home um, versus studio just simply has to do with your address. It has nothing to do with the location. So, so if you're operating your business from a home, then we would do the home base and, it, and, and a studio from a studio. And in either case, they're shooting at the same place, the pool at the city. It's exactly the same endorsement. And this pol the same, each policy covers that situation um, exactly the same way. So you would just contact, like if I was doing this shoot, I would contact you mm -hmm. and you would send them proof of this. Yep. That I'm covered. Yeah. Spot. Today, um, a client from, um, uh, a, a new client from Ho in Hawaii um, sent me his old policy and he sent me a list of all of his additional insurance. There were eight of them on the same policy. And he goes to those same resorts all the times, Four Seasons and the Hurt, the Weston, and he's always shooting at these same resorts. And so he's got to have those certs in place all the time. And uh, and so we can do that and take care of it for you. Yeah. Uh, so some of us are doing a little bit more video with mm -hmm. our photography. Yeah. If it's a one man crew, cameras pretty much dslrs or maybe it's a one type of camera bigger but it's a video camera yeah. how much of a difference does that have on the policies yeah okay so so the remember we taught we had that slide about um the drone photography there's a higher risk exposure type of photographer the insurance companies view video versus still as a higher risk exposure I can't get my head around it yet. And I, and most of the videographers have pretty compelling arguments why it doesn't make any sense, especially since they're using a DSLR and all they're doing is flipping a switch and now it's running in motion instead of in still, but it's anyway. So I've, I've heard, I've heard about, so, but it is a higher risk exposure and some of the companies won't do it. So let me give you the underwriting guidelines for some of them. Um, some of them say we will let we will write your policy under our policy pro our photography program if you're doing video and it's in a controlled um, viewing audience. So, for example, corporate events like this is really controlled. Um, if you're doing um, uh, oh, videos, a wedding, I do a lot of wedding videographers because you're hired by a client, you're doing a controlled uh, situation, it's going to them and it, they're sharing it with their people, right? It's just kind of a control thing. If you start doing video where you're doing the creative, where you're really doing film production or video production and you're doing um, things that are out on YouTube, and you're going for real extreme cool stuff so you can get 6.8 million views and then someone will throw advertising money at you, right? Those, they don't want them. Most of the carriers just don't want to have anything to do with that. I have a carrier that will do it, but the premium starts in the $1,500 to $2,000 a year level. Um, so it's just going to be more expensive than this um, type of stuff. So, But it is available. We, we have it. It's just It's just a higher risk. So. Look, look how violent and scary the videographers are. I know, aren't they? Big tripods. <laughs> They're going to do all kinds of damage, aren't they? I'm sorry. Right now, you're a discriminated group for sure. <laughs> so sorry, but they'll come around. Things evolve, and and so yeah. 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 Y
So if you do, if you go to a business and you're photographing people at a business, it's not a model. They're impl- you're you're shooting executives or whatever. Yeah. And you're on their property. Do you have to be concerned about your insurance? Because when you have a model, you said. Yeah. I, I guess now I'm confused. Okay. Do we treat business people different? I don't shoot models. I shoot real people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, in that case, they're in often in their place. They're in their place of You're business. In their place of business. Yep. So no concern whatsoever. Your okay. policy is absolutely going to cover your clients um, for anything that could happen to them based on your mistake or, or negligence or just a simple accident. A wind um, you know, catches a light stand, blows it over and hits your client, they're injured, yeah, you're covered. It's all under liability coverage, yeah. yeah. Where, where it's not is this, is that, that if, if, you're, if you get a, an assistant to come and hold the light stand for you, and there you're, it, you've hired them, a subcontractor, they stand there and hold the light stand. The light stand tips over and hits them and hurts them, and they're at the hospital getting stitches, and you call me and say, Howard, my assistant was injured. I need to file a, policy, a, a claim on my policy for liability. I'll say, you're not liable to yourself because that person is someone you hired and is working for you. The workers' comp covers that. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So should we, when we hire or use assistants, uh, do we need to make sure that they somehow have some coverage? I don't think assistants are aware that they need to have any kind of coverage because if I call somebody up and say, hey, can you work a uh, half day, you know, next Tuesday, you know, yeah. and they go, yeah, well, I'm not thinking about them working for me because I'm paying them. So right. they in turn, in, in my judgment, are kind of, kind of their own business yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't wouldn't yeah. they be yeah so so in in the state of california i'm absolutely positive that that person is now even though they're a sub and it's a 1099 relationship um they're your employee and you need to have workers comp i'm not 100 percent sure of the laws in arizona but i have had arizona photographers tell me that they're being required by the state with some type of um, contract that they have to do for a client to have workers' comp insurance for both employees and subs based on whatever whoever they're shooting for. So, so you get workers' comp insurance on a shoot-by-shoot basis? You can't. It's an annual thing. Yeah. Well, it's a... But you, pay, you may pay never hire the, the same... Is it... It's the, just based on payroll it's or not based on 1099... The Right. No, it's not individual. We don't list people on the policy. It's okay. not like health insurance okay. or anything like that. Gotcha. Yeah. It's just what your total payroll is for the year for second shooters or employees. Yeah. Yeah. So, Howard, if I had a, uh, I hired a grip company, but within that grip company, um, they have equipment they bring, generators, they set mm-hmm. up lights and stuff. Mm-hmm. I've actually hired the company, not that individual person, mm-hmm. and they get hurt. Yeah, that they are required to carry their own insurance. That's correct. So the relationship, the contract that you have is with a company, that company, and you are the the general and they're your plumber. Right. So you you might want to say to them, hey, you need to add me to your policy as an additional insured to make sure that they've got all their paperwork. That's legal separation and legal definition beforehand. That, the reason I brought that up, it would be the same thing if you're hiring an assistant, if they're their own company. Oh. But you would have to make sure that that assistant has his own insurance policy that That's, covers industrial or, if you will, workers' comp. Business or workers' yes. comp, yeah. And yeah, the it, same would go for me as mm-hmm. an employee. If I don't have workers' comp and mm-hmm. I get hurt on my job, mm-hmm. my insurance is not going to cover me. So that same applies to you as well. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in workers comp, you can either opt to insure yourself for injury or not. Most people, most business owners opt out because, for example, I have health insurance that covers me on and off the job. 
And so I opt out of um, the insurance for workers' comp, but I do insure my, all of my employees, all of my employees, yeah. Yeah. So, but I can see how I'm being a little vague on that. So I, 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 I'll have to dig into that a little bit more. But if you hire a separate corporation, maybe it's based on the entity. If it's an LLC or an S corp, you know, you're hiring a company to do work for you as a subcontract sub versus an assistant that you're bringing in to hire. Maybe that's it, an individual versus an LLC. But I'll get an answer for you. I will get an answer for you. We need some questions from that side of the room. So move over to that side. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen? Ellen? So we were talking earlier about where the money goes. So if I'm paying you or if you're paying me, yeah. what if nobody's paying anyone? What if you're doing a portfolio building trade shoot? So in that case, who's the client or you know, would they be covered by a liability or would they, you know, would they be considered my employee? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I would assume, let's see. So if you're doing a, a project, if it's your project for your portfolio, then, it's, then you're the main person and these folks that are coming in to help you are really your assistants and your subs, even though money isn't exchanged or, or isn't changing hands, if they're just helping or assisting. So if you then, in the process of doing that shoot, injure or harm another person or do damage to another property, to others' property, then um, or, or one of your assistants do, then your policy would cover that activity, that whole activity, yeah. even though money's not changing hands. Yeah.